Welcome to this new module. Today we will talk about methods for analyzing the impact of climate change on agricultural productivity. At the end of this module, learners will be able to understand why an analysis of the impacts of climate change on agriculture is important, how climate change is impacting agricultural activities, the types and sources of climate change impacts, methods for analyzing climate change, and how to apply these methods. But above all, we need to know why an analysis of the climate change impacts on agriculture is important. According to the FAO, climate change could manifest in an increase in average temperatures, changes in rainfall patterns and water availability, a sea level rise in salination of ecosystems, and an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. As can be seen in this figure, in the Sahel, the average monthly temperatures have not been homogeneous over the last 30 years. Temperatures appear to be higher in the spring and autumn, so above 1 degree Celsius, from March to October, compared to the overall average of about 0.5 degrees Celsius. At the global level, the increases in temperature can cause a uniform change in the amounts of precipitation. Subtropical areas or high latitudes tend to dry up while an increase in precipitation at low and mid latitudes is observed. The figure opposite shows the data and projections of the overall mean sea level. It shows that over the last three centuries, the level has continued to increase. The paleoclimatic data is in purple. The tide gauge data is in blue, red, and green. And the altimeter data is sky blue. All values are relative to pre-industrial values and are expressed in meters. Other characteristics resulting from climate change are violent weather, such as flooding, sometimes caused by ice jams or dam failures. There are also extreme summer events, such as cyclones, lightning, tornadoes, tropical storms, and hurricanes. Drought is another manifestation of climate change, though that takes longer to develop. Finally, there are forest fires, which are often caused by lightning. Finally, for more than a hundred years, the combustion of large quantities of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, to supply energy to factories, vehicles, and homes, has been delivering greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O, into the atmosphere. For their part, cows, humans, rice fields, and wastewater emits CH4, while N2O is derived from fertilizers and pesticides used for crops. As well, deforestation reduces the number of trees able to absorb CO2. In view of the above-mentioned climate change events, one can only wonder how climate change is impacting agricultural activities. According to the FAO from 2015, an increase in temperatures can encourage some crops to grow faster as higher temperatures accelerate growth. However, for other types of crops, faster growth reduces the time it takes for seeds to ripen, which can decrease yields. It can also encourage an increase in weeds, pests, and mold, which thrive under high temperatures. Also from the FAO, an intensification of extreme weather events, such as floods and droughts, can affect crops and reduce yields. Higher levels of CO2 can improve yields for some crops, although yields can also be reduced if these crops do not have enough water or nutrients. Higher temperatures and heat waves can cause distress to animals, which can increase their vulnerability to disease and reduce their fertility and milk production. Climate change can facilitate the spread of livestock-specific diseases and pests. Higher levels of CO2 can improve the yield of some forage species, 
on which animals feed, although some research suggests that the quality of some forages may decrease. Water scarcity associated with droughts could reduce drinking water and fodder resources for livestock, effectively decreasing livestock production. Climate change can affect forest growth and productivity. With sufficient water and nutrients, higher CO2 levels can help trees increase their productivity. Higher temperatures can increase the length of the growing season, but can also cause some species to move to other geographic areas. The expected increase in frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, droughts, forest fires, floods, hurricanes, and windstorms can cause considerable damage to forests, which would reduce their healthiness or size. Droughts can increase the vulnerability of trees to insect invasions and fires. The latter can also contribute to climate change by causing CO2 from trees to release rapidly into the atmosphere. Insect invasions could intensify as higher temperatures can allow some insect species to grow faster. These invasions can weaken or even kill trees, and the CO2 contained in these trees is then released into the atmosphere, contributing to global warming. Rising sea levels due to melting glaciers and pack ice and thermal expansion will affect fishing communities, especially those living in low-lying countries, deltas, or coastal areas. Climate change may lead to a change in marine or freshwater species, and some fish-specific diseases may become more pronounced in warmer waters. Rising temperatures could increase the salinity of marine waters and freshwater as well. Changes in temperature and seasons could alter breeding and migration periods. Extreme weather events, for instance hurricanes, changes in monsoon patterns, droughts or floods, are currently affecting the fish industry and aquaculture production and infrastructure, and consequently the human lives and livelihoods that depend on them. Now, what are the types and sources of impacts of climate change on agriculture? The literature differentiates between several types of climate change impacts on agriculture. These include 1. Changes in the mix of crops and thus in the type of agriculture and the use of rural land. 2. Changes in production, farm income and rural employment. And 3. Changes in the evolution of rural income, the contribution to the national GDP and agricultural export earnings. And agricultural export earnings. Although there are positive impacts related to rising temperatures, the possibility of growing new crops, the expansion of cultivable territories, the lengthening of the season of protected crops, the fertilization of CO2, the acceleration of plant maturation, and the reduction of water stress, the negative impacts are many. The increase in insect infestations, damage to crops due to extreme heat, increased soil erosion, weed growth, water pressure, and the frequency of droughts. Let us now turn our attention to the sources of climate change impacts on agriculture. The literature distinguishes climate sources from meteorological sources. The main difference between climate and weather is the duration. According to the literature, climate is determined by long-term modeling of average and extreme temperatures and precipitation at a given location. Thus, climate descriptions may refer to areas of local, regional, or global extent. For its part, the weather reflects the daily or short-term state of changes in the atmosphere. There are six main components or parts of the weather. Temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind, humidity, precipitation, and cloudiness. Therefore, one can describe the climate using the middle or higher order moments of the distribution. For its part, the weather remains a unique achievement outside of the climate distribution and is subject to continuous fluctuations. 
With these differences between climate and weather, it should be noted that the impacts of climate change on agriculture can come from 1. Changes in climate variables 2. Variations in heat stress measured by drought indices and 3. Long and short-term heat stress mitigation decisions adaptation measures to the effects of climate change. For example, investments in sustainable assets. In regards to heat stress, the literature offers a varied range of drought indices. These include the severity of the Palmer drought, used in Palmer's work in 1965, or Alley's in 1984. The standardized precipitation event, used in Hayes et al.'s work, the rainfall anomaly, used in the work of Gibbs et al., 1967. The aridity index, used in the work of Gomes et al., 2010. The normal precipitation measure, used in the work of Hayes, 2006. And the temperature humidity event, used in the Key and Sneeringer works in 2014. The Manual on Drought Indicators and Indices of the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the Global Water Partnership, GWP, provides a wide range of indices and their method calculation. In this course, we do not use indices. Our practical case is based on climate variables. Specifically, we use the maximum and minimum daily temperatures of the air, other analyses could introduce their respective variability, the frequency at which temperatures fall above or below critical levels, and the days accumulated during the growing season. We also use the average monthly precipitations. Other analyses could introduce their variability or solar environment and its daily variability. Now let us turn our attention to methods for analyzing the impacts of climate change on agriculture. The literature distinguishes four levels of analysis, studies analyzing the impacts on crop yields, those looking at the impacts on production and income at farm and village level, those analyzing the effects on national and regional production, and finally those studying the impacts on products and world prices. The implementation of these studies is done in eight steps. 1. Identify vulnerable regions and subsectors of agriculture that should be studied. 2. Analyze the yield climate relationships for these selected exposure units to determine important climate variables. 3. Consider changes in these variables that are likely to be most significant. 4. Analyze the effect of these changes on crop yields and other first order effects. Analyze the effect of yield degradation on second-order aspects, for example, farm production and income. 6. Evaluate responses at the farm level. 7. To analyze the effect of production at farm level on regional production, employment, economic activity, etc. 8. Assessing responses at the regional level. It should be noted that each level of analysis calls for appropriate analytical methods. In general, there are three types of methods. Impact assessment, assessment of responses or accommodation, and scenario studies. The sequence of the eight analysis steps could be modified according to the requirements of the study. The sequence of the eight steps involves three types of analysis of the effects of climate change. One, steps one to six, except for step three, refer to impact experiments. Two, step three refers to scenario development. And three, steps seven and eight refer to adaptation experiments. Different approaches with different consequences are used to assess the impacts of climate change. Among other things, the literature distinguishes between economic approaches, agronomic approaches, and laboratory or field experiments. Economic approaches are based on different methods. We distinguish between simple economic problems. These are revisions based on a structured framework of economic, 
production, consumption, and governance policies, and agricultural, production techniques and alternative crops, information available to address vulnerability issues. These methods can be used for the analysis and interpretation of most climate impact studies. We also have the economic regression models. These are statistical relationships between climate variables and economic indicators. The adaptation of farmers to local climatic conditions is implicitly taken into account. World food prices and domestic agricultural production prices are considered constant. We have microeconomic models based on the objective of maximizing the economic returns of inputs. They are designed to simulate the decision-making process of a representative farmer with regard to the methods of production and allocation of land, labor, existing infrastructure, and new capital. Finally, we have the macroeconomic models. These are equilibrium methods which include price-sensitive behavior on the part of consumers and producers. For the purposes of climate change, these models allocate domestic and foreign consumption and regional production according to the given disturbances in agricultural production, water supply, and irrigation demand derived from biophysical techniques. In macroeconomic models, population growth and technological improvements are defined exogenously. These models measure the potential magnitude of the impacts of climate change on the economic well-being of producers and consumers of agricultural products. Projected changes in output and prices from agricultural sectoral models can then be used in the general equilibrium models of the economy. For economic regression models, the literature distinguishes cross-sectional analysis, analysis based on panel data, hybrid approaches, which include models for dealing with heterogeneous marginal effects, models of long differences, and approaches to partitioning variation. Cross-sectional regression makes it possible to use cross-sectional variations in the climate to estimate the long-term equilibrium effects of climate change on agriculture. It requires that farmers have fully adjusted their investments and management practices to maximize production in the climate they face, as long as the climate differences observed are assumed to be stable in the long term. Therefore, the cross-sectional approach provides an estimate of the long-term response to climate change and can be used to estimate the equilibrium costs of climate change. For cross-sectional analysis, the standard equation for a unit of analysis I can take the form Yi, the agricultural result equal to a function of climactic variables F, Ci, to which is added the controls control I and the error term epsilon I. These types of analysis do not use meteorological variables, and climate variables can be introduced directly into the model in a non-linear way. In addition to the work of Mendelssohn et al., 1994, there are various other applications of the literature on cross-sectional data analysis models, as can be seen opposite. Several limitations are known to exist in cross-sectional analysis. These include the biases in the results due to the omitted variables. Rickard's approach does not allow for disaggregating the results for specific crops or types of livestock. The risk of a weak causal identification and the potential endogeneity of land use decisions for the identification of marginal effects. Regression on panel data allows us to exploit climatic fluctuations from one year to the next, presumably randomly, to model the effect of climate change on agricultural yield benefits, to correct identification problems with cross-sectional approaches, and to control the fixed effects as well as to solve the problem of omitted variables. For analysis on panel data, the standard equation for a unit of analysis I at time t can take the form yit, which is the agricultural result equal to beta wit plus 
mu i plus lsi, theta t epsilon i. These types of analysis include wit meteorological variables in linear form. For their part, climate variables are replaced by fixed effects ls2 mu i plus theta t. Apart from the work of Deschen and Greenstone in 2012, there are many applications of literature, as you can see here, on panel data models. In the literature, several limitations are identified on modeling climate change impacts based on panel data. Climate effects are identified using weather fluctuations rather than climactic differences. Farmers do not always respond to climate change in a way that is significantly identical to how they respond to weather shocks. And since it uses exclusively meteorological data, known as short-term variables, it only partially captures the impact on farmers of long-term adaptive behavior. Dell et al. 2014, Sang 2016, and other authors suggest hybrid approaches. The idea is to estimate models that combine cross-sectional, interannual, and decent annual variations in climate variables to estimate the effects of climate change on agricultural outcomes while controlling for unobservable confounding variables. Models that study the average effects on longer term intervals and models that provide more credibility to the assumption of comparability of marginal treatment through the gradual nature of climate change. Several methods are proposed in the literature under hybrid approaches. We distinguish estimation models from heterogeneous marginal effects. These models can be estimated in the nonlinear panel framework or in the two-step panel framework. In the nonlinear panel framework, the standard equation for a unit of analysis i at time t can take the form y i t, which is the agricultural result equal to a nonlinear function of the meteorological variables w i t plus mu i theta t epsilon i t. Climate variables are replaced by fixed effects, mu i plus theta t. Examples of this application can be found in the work of Dera Eugenia, Sang, 2017, and Burke et al., 2015. In the two-step step panel framework, the standard equation in the first step assumes that for a unit of analysis i at time t, the agricultural result y i t is equal to beta i w i t plus mu i plus theta t epsilon i t. In the second step, the meteorological coefficient of the first step is beta i equal to a nonlinear function of the climactic variables f c i, to which is added the controls control i plus epsilon i. Climate variables are replaced by fixed effects mu i plus theta t. Examples of this application can be found in the work of Derayugina, Sang, 2017, and Burke et al., 2015. As part of the hybrid approaches, we can also distinguish between long-distance estimation models and partitioning variation models. While the former includes meteorological variables in a linear form and medium-term climate variables through long differences, the latter includes both types of variables in non-linear form. To be convinced of this, the authors compared the fixed effects estimator and the long difference estimator. Suppose the yield is given by the data generation process as indicated on the slide where delta S refers to the short-term response of yield to weather shocks, delta L is the long-term response of yield to climate. CIT and WIT represent unobservable climatic and weather shocks separately, respectively. We ask XIT to equal WIT and CIT. 
Under these conditions, the presence of long-term adaptation assumes that delta S is different than delta L. The linear model with fixed effects is given by the formulas here. The long difference estimator, LD, is the OLS estimator of the model defined here. It follows that the difference between beta FE and beta LD depends on the difference between beta S and beta L. The difference between beta FE and beta LD is determined by PC, which is the proportion of climate variability to weather variability. The larger that the PC is, the more beta FE and beta LD will be close, even if beta S and beta L are different from one another. The power of the test, based on the difference between the FE and LD estimators, can be seen in the finished samples. Although the LD estimator always provides an unbiased estimate of the long-term effect, the inference regarding the true extent of adaptation and its economic significance is unknown. The analysis in the panel data presents significant econometric problems. Among other things, we have the problems of multicollinearity, heterogeneity, serial or spatial correlation in the climate series, or even in the choice of the impact analysis model. Climate data are often correlated with each other. For instance, in the climactic data of temperate regions, it is often found that hot summer weather is accompanied by dry conditions. Precipitation is low when temperatures are high. As a result, it is difficult to disentangle the effects of temperature and precipitation using data collected under normal conditions. The presence of multicollinearity between the explanatory variables could bias the estimation of the parameters. To treat multicollinearity problems, Condur et al. 2020 and other authors suggest using the principal component analysis or factor analysis. However, a limitation to this approach is that the correlated variables can have independent effects. There is also the regression of peaks or various other techniques for removing variables, including the method based on the ICA criteria. In the decline of peaks, the main difficulty is to estimate the parameter of settings, lambda LS3. We can control for this with the standardized climate variables. Specifically, standardization should focus on potentially correlated climate variables. But this approach does not correct the correlation between the main climate variables, but rather between the latter and their interactions. Another problem concerns heterogeneity, some areas of uncertainty. The spatially heterogeneous distribution of CO2 concentrations is a factor of uncertainty in assessing the impact of climate change. The effects of climate change are heterogeneous in location. While some regions were experiencing a significant negative impact, others were benefiting from the rising temperatures. Not considering the heterogeneity observed or not in the analysis of climate change impacts could bias the results. For example, a high spatial heterogeneity of temperature increases has a significant correlation with a greater tolerance to warming temperatures in insects on a global scale. To illustrate this, we can consider the model here. A simple manipulation of the linear fixed effects estimator quickly shows that this is an average weighted by the variance of the estimators of the unit specific slope coefficients beta i, such as presented here. Thus, if we assume that our cross sectional units are regions, the coefficient estimates for regions with a proportionally greater interannual variability in temperature receive a higher weight in the FE estimator. This situation could lead to a downward bias in the estimates of the average effect of temperature on the results in practice. In general, however, the sign and extent of bias will depend on the empirical context. 
Another problem concerns the serial and spatial correlation of the series of climatic variables. Serial correlations occur when the residuals of a time series are not independent. The literature distinguishes between two types of serial correlation. There is a pure partial correlation and an impure one. In the first, it occurs when the error of one period is correlated with the errors of other periods and the model is assumed to be correctly specified. The best known form is the first order autocorrelation. Impure autocorrelation is due to a specification error such as an omitted variable or ignorance of nonlinearities. Serial correlation means that the OLS is no longer a minimum variance estimator. Serial correlation results when the estimated variances of the regression coefficients are biased, leading to unreliable hypothesis tests. The statistics T will in fact appear to be more important than they are in reality. To correct the serial correlation, one can resort to the Cochrane-Orcutt procedure, see more details in Beach and McKinnon, 1978. We can also refer to the Newey West standard error procedure. See more details in Hochschild, 2007. Spatial correlation is when the values of climate variables sampled at nearby locations are not independent of one another. Tobler, 1970. The causes of spatial autocorrelation are multiple in the literature, but three factors are particularly common. First, there is the fact that the dispersion, or the interactions between the climate variables, are related to the distance between them. Second, the literature questions the fact that the nonlinear relationships between climatic variables and agricultural outcome could incorrectly be modeled as linear. Finally, Basag, in 1974, identified the fact that the model would not take into account a spatially structured determining factor, which would cause a spatial structuring of the response. There is, however, a discussion in the scientific literature that the last two points have more to do with the problem of spatial dependence than with spatial autocorrelation. In most cases, the presence of spatial autocorrelation is considered a serious gap for hypothesis testing and prediction, as it violates the independently and identically distributed error hypothesis known to most standard statistical procedures. It thus inflates type 1 errors and will sometimes even reverse the slope of the relationships from the non-spatial analysis. In the literature on climate change impact analysis, various methods have been developed to correct for the effects of spatial autocorrelation. These include 1. Autocovariant models. You can consult the work of Smith, 1994, Kaitetal, 2002, Yamaguchi et al., 2003, and Dorman et al., 2007, for further study. 2. Spatial models based on generalized least squares regression. Here, for a deepening of understanding of these types of models, you can look at the work of Sang, 1974, Cliff and Ord, 1981, and Dorman et al., 2007. And three, there are also the work on generalized spatial estimation surveys that you can consult. Liang and Zager, 1986, and Dorman et al., 2007, are examples of them. Finally, another problem lies in the varied choice of the models. The choice of summary statistics of the daily meteorological variables to be used as explanatory data in the impact model would imply a choice of models suitable for the impact assessment. Schlenker and Roberts, 2009, suggest using the Monte Carlo cross-validation in model selection. Applications exist with the work of Arlo and Celis, 2010, or Gammons et al., 2017. In the following section, we estimate a model of the impact of climate change, taking into account the econometric problems mentioned above. 
It should be recalled that the database used for climate change impact analysis combines data from different sources. Agricultural products using the FAO, the World Bank, and the Farm Survey, etc. Socioeconomic issues using the World Bank, the OECD, and the National Socioeconomic Survey of Agricultural Households, etc. Climate and weather data using the World Bank, National Weather and Climate Data Centers, and the Tu Tiempo website, etc. Our application concerns the impacts of climate change on groundnut yield in the Sikasso region of Mali. This is a study that was carried out by Musa et al. in 2017. Consider the database, database.data which is a compilation of the databases of the Regional Directorate of Agriculture, the DRA, of Mali, and Mateo Mali. It covers the period from 1984 to 2014 and collects data from variables such as yield, area, production, minimum and maximum temperature, rainfall, and the interaction between rain and temperature. The following are the descriptive statistics for the analysis data. Here are the trends in the change over time of the different areas and the agricultural production over time in each of the circles studied in the Sikasso region of Mali. Here are the graphs of the change over time of the temperatures in each circle. Here is the trend of the variability of the yield compared to the average values. The estimation of the fixed effects model, Cobb-Douglas model and quadratic model, on the analysis data gives the following results. Results on yield elasticities to climate variables are presented in the table 